uh, get into some great uh, questions and answers and have a lively discussion with you. Uh, but to sort of set up a discussion and while you're eating and enjoying your, your meal, I was just going to say a little bit about power and influence, kind of a psychological perspective on leadership. And let me uh, tell you why I think this is such an important topic. Uh, first of all, intellectually, I think all of us know power is important. We all know that power is important for implementation, for execution. Interestingly enough, despite our intellectual awareness to the idea that power is important, a lot of us have ambivalence about the concept of power. And one manifestation of that ambivalence, if you, if you pick up a lot of leadership books and look in the index, there might be a page or two at most talking about power. Instead, the leadership books talk about vision, and charisma, and uh, transformational leadership, team building, trust building, all these great things. It's as if power is the four-letter word in the uh, leadership literature. By the way, I was given a talk about power to a Japanese audience not too long ago, and I had this slide up that said, power is the four-letter word in the leadership literature, and this Japanese scholar came up to me afterwards, he said, excuse me, Professor Kramer, I hate to be rude, but you have a mistake in your PowerPoint, power is actually a five-letter word, and I got myself trying to explain what a four-letter word is in the American idiom, but I think we all in this room know uh, what that means. Uh, and I, it's really important to confront our ambivalence about power. We don't teach people to think systematically about power in our educational system. I'm a parent, I have two small children. If I ask my child, what do you want to be when you grow up, and my daughter said, Dad, I want to be more powerful, I don't think as a parent I'd be happy about that as an ambition. <laughs> and yet, to get things done, we really need to understand power. And even if we're uncomfortable with the sense of power as being part of our identity as a leader, and I do a lot of work with executives, business executives, and government executives, and when I talk about power, it's really interesting to me how many of them say power is not part of the way they like to think about themselves. It's not part of their identity. Uh, they like to think of themselves as inspiring leaders, as positive people. Uh, so they have kind of a negative association of power. I think to the extent we have that ambivalence about power, we risk leaving the playing field, giving the home court advantage, if you will, to those people who aren't ambivalent about power, who aren't uncomfortable with power and its uh, nine out of ten, I did a study not too long ago, and nine out of ten of the executives, senior executives in government and business that I interviewed, said that they've been burned at least once in a power struggle, that they failed to see something coming, they trusted the wrong person, they trusted someone too much, they underestimated the political dynamics in the situation, and they learned from that experience. Well, my philosophy is let's learn from other people's experience. Let's talk about power and think about it so that we don't have to uh, go through the fire and the crucible of that learning experience ourselves. And so, even defensively, it's important to understand power as a skill. A way of thinking about the political landscape, how to analyze it, how to navigate in it safely and effectively. So it's a topic I really enjoy teaching because I think it's kind of neglected. Uh, now, there's lots of ways of thinking about power, and I, this is, I promise, the most academic slide. No upside down A's, but the most academic slide I'll have. And then we move to some more interesting uh, video. Uh, there's positional power, and as fellows of this institution, you have positional power. Uh, people have uh, uh, resources they confer on you, uh, rights and so forth, related to your position in this institution. That's kind of a formal, structural kind of power that's important to understand. All of us also have social power, and our social power is kind of relational. It's informal because it arises from our relationships with other people. And many of you already are developing these informal relationships with faculty, with administrators, with your peers and so forth, this kind of power is defined by our ability to network effectively, to form social ties, alliances, to build a reputation. Uh, and the reputation might be the trustworthiness, toughness, credibility, expertise, whatever it is. But these are kinds of sources of power that come to us from other people. And then we have personal power. And for the standpoint of today's talk, this is what I want to emphasize. Personal power is our perceptual skills, our ability to analyze political situations, understand them, and then our, our persuasive abilities, and our abilities to navigate effectively in a political situation, to use our persuasive skills to get things done. Uh, a lot of us, in my experience, are great clinically. We know how to analyze things. We're taught for years and years in schools to analyze things. We're not often taught how to execute, how to implement, how to persuade. So personal power to me is interesting because it's the power that kind of determines whether or not we actually fully use and engage our positional power. 
To me, the great example of this is you think about the different U.S. presidents. In a sense, all the presidents have the same positional power. They occupy the Oval Office to be sure they encounter different kinds of, they inherit uh, different kinds of uh, problems and opportunities, but they all have the positional power of the presidency, and we've seen striking differences in the ability of those individuals who occupy that to command that power. You know, I always love the contrast between Jimmy Carter, a person who most people felt was one of the most intelligent presidents we've had, an engineer, brilliant, analytical, micromanager, uh, wonderfully attentive to detail, and yet not able to get much done in Washington. And then you have Ronald Reagan come in, and people characterize him in a famous way as the amiable dunce, a person who doesn't seem to have much intellectual horsepower, uh, intellectual skills, and yet remarkably adept at working the levers of power. So there's something about this personal power dimension which is quite interesting. And that's what I was going to talk a little bit about today. Now there's lots of ways to try to study this. Uh, and again, I don't want to go too much into academic detail about this. You know, we can do laboratory experiments where we manipulate people's power uh, and so forth. We can observe what happened. I've been interested in studying power in real world situations. Uh, where you try, especially as a psychologist, to actually see behavior in action. And so I've been interested in looking at situations where people display different kinds of power moves, where they use different kinds of influence tactics, uh, presidential debates, testimony in formal hearings, press conferences. These are often situations that expose leaders to situations where they have to reveal their true selves to, or their, at least their true skills. So you think about Oliver North his testimony at the Iran Contra hearings, this Congress that thought they had this young lieutenant <coughs> by the neck, and he managed to brilliant with this little uh, squeal out. Clarence Thomas, a person whose back seemed to be against the wall in his confirmation hearings, a man who brilliantly played the race card in lots of ways and, and carried the day. Uh, Condi Rice, I think, is a very skillful performer if you saw her confrontation with Barbara Boxer. You know, this is a woman who's not going to be pushed around easily. Uh, Dan Quayle, I often use as a counterexample. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, not exactly a comic for but a person who often has the basic ability to shoot himself in the president's foot. Uh, so, you know, by looking at these examples of people in the public limelight, if you will, you can begin to sort of develop a micro theory about how power and persuasion work. Now, because I have a fascination with these kinds of unusual sources of data, uh, it turns out there's one treasure trove uh, of material that uh, scholars have had access to. We have several thousand hours of Lyndon Johnson's secret White House recordings, as many of you uh, know. I don't know. How many of you have heard many of these recordings, by the way? Yeah, not everyone. If you haven't heard them, it's really one of the great sources of entertainment and insight about how power <laughs> works and how power uh, politics work. Uh, Lyndon Johnson decided to secretly record many of his conversations partly because he wanted to have a record so if anyone ever misrepresented what happened in the Oval Office in one of his negotiations, he could correct the record. He also probably anticipated writing his memoirs. Uh, he also knew that other presidents had secretly recorded their conversations, something the public, American public did not know about. Uh, so uh, John Kennedy secretly recorded, of course, many conversations in the Oval Office. Uh, Dwight Eisenhower had recorded conversations that he wanted a record of at FDR. So this has gone back a long time ago. And if you don't know the story, I'll just say it as an interesting sort of sidelight. When uh, Lyndon Johnson was leaving the presidency in 1968 and Richard Nixon was coming in, Lyndon Johnson showed Richard Nixon this wonderful taping system and said, you know, this is the greatest thing. Everything you say will be recorded uh, on a record. And to his credit, Richard Nixon, who was a little bit paranoid and had great political instincts, said, you know, I think this is a terrible idea. He didn't say this to Johnson, but he said to his aide, I think this is a terrible idea, and so he removed the presidential taping system. Then after several months in the Oval Office, he decided, you know, it would be nice to have a record of everything that was said here, or at least have a record. And so he reinstalled the system. And uh, uh, the funny thing, the only thing that's interesting about that is both Kennedy and Johnson had a manually activated recording system. So they would decide what got recorded. Nixon was not very good mechanically, and he decided to have an automatic system that recorded everything, <laughs> and he'd edit the tapes later, I think he thought, and of course he never quite got that chance. Uh, so, <laughs> the reason Johnson is interesting is because by many accounts, you have oral descriptions of this breathtaking ability to influence even very tough, tenacious, experienced people on the other side of the bargaining table. Uh, Jack Valenti, who I've had a chance to interview, 
uh, several times my Johnson work, said that Lyndon Johnson was an awesome engine of a man, terrorizing, tender, inexhaustibly energetic, ruthless, patient, compassionate, bully, insensitive, tough, resolute, charming, earthy. It goes on and on. All of these things, he was this. Uh, Bill Moyers, who was also an aide, uh, now of course a television personality, but at the time an aide in the White House, said he was 13 of the most interesting and difficult man I've ever met. Uh, he had an animal sense of weakness in other men. I think you'll see that in just a moment. It was so famous that it was called the Johnson Treatment. When Johnson worked on it, they just called it the treatment. Uh, Jack Valenti said the telephone was his Excalibur, and he played it like Stradivarius played the violin. Kind of a mixed metaphor, but I think it communicates. Uh, George Reedy, one of his aides at the time, said about his telephone technique, he could practically crawl through that telephone wire, and the full treatment was an incredible thing. It was a combination of badgering, cajolery, promises of future favors, threats of future consequences, if things weren't done. When that man started to work on you, it was like you were under a waterfall and the stuff was just pouring down on you. Uh, Doris Kearns Goodwin, who I suspect you've seen on Nightline and some talk shows, said he could be fierce, friendly, gracious, intimidating, cajoling, threatening, passionate, obstinate, charming, menacing, ingratiating, and frightening, all in the space of the same conversation in the space of a few minutes. The velocity of this man's influence attempts was just breathtaking, and we're going to see that now. I wanted to show you, uh, and I, I should say, ladies and gentlemen, the context of this is I'm writing a piece for the Harvard Business Review on intimidating leaders, because bullying leaders have gotten a bad rap. But there's a side of intimidation, creative coercion, that actually sometimes is necessary to get things done. Uh, there's a difference between using coercion creatively to, to take on resistant recalcitrant organizations and bullying that just abuse them. But Lyndon Johnson you know, had this great passion. He wanted to eradicate poverty. He wanted to eradicate racial injustice in this country. He wanted to do something about uh, this, the weak. He wanted to change the educational systems for the better so more people would access. And he was willing to twist arms to do that. I just wanted to show you a little bit of his arm twisting. The first conversation you're going to see is only a few days after Lyndon Johnson has inherited the mantle of the presidency. Uh, Kennedy has been assassinated. And Lyndon Johnson has decided, for a variety of reasons, that he'd like to form a special commission to investigate the assassination of President Kennedy. A lot of his motives are political. He's afraid that Texas is going to investigate this as a state homicide. Johnson knows Texas politics quite well, and he doesn't relish the thought of an independent inquiry. He knows Congress is lobbying to investigate the assassination, and he understands uh, congressional politics all too well. He would like the investigation to be controlled so that uh, the, the con conclusion will basically come out in a way that uh, furthers the interest of the nation. So he's decided he's going to create this commission, the Warren Commission. Unfortunately, nobody wants to be on this commission. This is a political hot potato. A lot of people at the time, right after Kennedy's killed, believe there's a, the possibility of a conspiracy. Uh, and Johnson knows that he's going to have to twist some arms. And he's decided he wants his old friend Richard Russell to be on his commission. Now, the other thing you need to know about Richard Russell is Richard Russell, unfortunately, really intensely dislikes Earl Warren, the man Lyndon Johnson is going to pick to be on his commission. And notice how Johnson manages to convince Richard Russell to be on his commission. Uh, commission. Notice how he deals with uh, Richard Russell's uh, problematic relationship with Earl Warren. Just listen to the richness of the language, the velocity of the appeal, and notice how Richard Russell, a very savvy, experienced guy, has no chance to love what <laughs> <playing field. laughs> One final other thing you should know, by the way, is Richard Russell had been like a father to Lyndon Johnson. He was a mentor to this man. And notice how when Russell tries to remind the president that I've done a lot for you in the past, and you know, I've been really good to you. Notice how Johnson deals with that. So, uh, Jeff, would be good. Let's see if we have lights that we can get into. Is that possible? Or we, we may not need to, actually, but come on, Christine. I'll do it. No, thank you very much. Just give me a spin. Does that mean Jeff, I'm supposed to be done, right? Oh, boy. Never do it, but the end is so important. Only a few days later, though, Lyndon Johnson had changed his mind. For both public relations and political reasons, Johnson had decided that he did want to form a blue ribbon panel at the federal level. He began a telephone campaign calling the most powerful members of Congress. He wanted them to squelch any congressional investigations. 
He wanted their approval for the panel that he had selected. And in classic Johnsonian fashion, he refused to take no for an answer from those he had chosen to serve on the panel. His last call of the day went to his old friend and mentor, Senator Richard Russell of Georgia. Listen to how Russell is bulldozed into serving on what will come to be known as the Warren Commission. I hate to bother you again, but uh, I want you to know that I made that announcement. Well, announcement what? Well, uh, this special commission. You have all that, yes. Uh, and I got Chief to hear it. May I read it to you? The President announced that he was appointing a special commission to study and report upon all the facts and circumstances relating to the assassination of the late President John F. Kennedy and the subsequent violent death of the man charged with the assassination. The President stated that the majority and minority leadership of the Senate and the House had been consulted with respect to the full special commission. The members of the special commission are, quote, Chief Justice Earl Warren Chairman, Senator Richard Russell, Georgia, Senator John Cooper, Kentucky, Representative Hale Bob, Louisiana, Representative Gerald Ford, Michigan, Honorable Alan Dulles, Washington, Honorable John J. McCoy, New York. Well, now, Mr. President, uh, I, I know I don't have to get my motion to you, but I just keep saying on that connection. I, uh, I'm highly honored to think about it in connection with it, but I, I could have said that with the Chief Justice Warren. I, I don't like that, man. I don't have any confidence in it. You never turned your country down? I could. You go, well, this is not me. This is your country. But uh, you got, you're my man on that commission, and you're going to do it. And don't tell me what you can do and what you can't, because uh, I can't arrest you. And I'm not going to put the FBI on you, but uh, you're that damn show going to serve, I'll tell you that. <laughs> and Secretary of State came over this afternoon. He's deeply concerned, Dick, about the idea that they're spreading throughout the communist world that could just kill Kennedy. Now, he didn't. He didn't have a damn thing to do with it. I don't think he did that right, but <laughs> oh, any observations, ladies and gentlemen? <laughs> what did you notice about this technique? You know, by the way, here's Richard Russell. It's a Saturday uh, afternoon. He's sitting at home, reading the newspaper. Johnson knew uh, Russell was kind of a quiet bachelor. He often stayed home, read the papers, read ten books a week. He was home reading, not expecting a call from the President of the United States. But what does Johnson do to him? I mean, basically, what happens here? He orders it. Yeah. Uh, I didn't catch the ending, though. How did they leave that conversation? Well, there was an absence of a thank you. You may have noticed that. <laughs> I didn't, I didn't, did he agree? He agreed. Yeah, he said, Mr. President, at I'm... Your, at your command. At your, at your, at your, at your command. He said, you're goddamn going to be my command as long as I'm here. You know, which is the alternative to the thank you for Lyndon yeah. Johnson. <laughs> <laughs> and this is a man who done many favors for Lyndon Johnson. He really had catapulted his political career. And notice how Johnson deals with that. Russell tries to remind him, you know, I've done a lot for you. And he says, well, it's not me. Who is it? It's your president, your country. Yeah. And you're, you're damn going to do this. Uh, any, any other observations? It's a lovely example of the Jim Johnson technique. Yes. I actually have more of a question. Yeah. An observation. It seems as if he bullied this person. And I was expecting persuasion in the sense of making the person happy to say thank you at the end of the conversation. So I actually, I'm, I was surprised. Yeah, I would have heard. So you think uh, maybe a softer, more ingratiating approach might have been quite effective? I'm not saying ingratiating, but certainly something that doesn't sound as mean to yeah. someone who was a, a mentor. And a friend. Yeah, so a lifelong mentor. Yeah, a softer approach, a soft power approach. Yeah. Well, let's come back to that. Yes. Even if we give you or this guy the benefit of the doubt and say this worked, yeah. I wonder if we aspire, even if we aspire to, could we get away with that? Could I personally, or you know, could even softer spoken or softer spoken women get away with that? Because I don't yeah. think you know this. Damn, you're gonna do damn this. I don't swear, and it's I think it's part of his yeah. style. I couldn't get away with that. I could. Yeah. 
What do you think? I mean, first of all, I'm not yeah. I hope it's clear I'm not recommending <laughs> it as a strategy. I'm not saying this is good leadership. In fact, Johnson, in a way, burned his bridges with a lot of people. He also, in, in a way, ironically, created a legacy of doubt with the Warren Commission because the document they produced was a half-hearted document because nobody really wanted to serve on this commission. The members of the Warren Commission, because they didn't like each other, barely met. I don't know how many people know this. They barely met. They would not often sit in a room together. And also, Richard Russell, the man who persuaded the Vietnamese Commission, ended up being the lone dissenter who insisted on signing a dissenting statement saying he did not believe the lone gunman theory. So he actually created a legacy of that. It was a self-defeating strategy. But it works in the short term. It works in the short term. Can we do it, though? I don't understand. If we can, yeah. we all be expected to learn that style if we wanted to. But I, I yeah. think it depends yeah. a lot on the circumstances. It seems to me, I mean, kind of along with Martinson, sort of, you know, kind of, I was surprised that he handled it this way because it seems there has to be there must have been a huge amount of leverage, whether it was because Johnson was the president or, or maybe something else aside from their political uh, uh, positions that allowed you know Johnson to just be able to, to, to force someone else to a particular position. I mean, it really wasn't any sign of persuasion. I think that uh, there has to have been something that we just not aware of uh, sort of power dynamics. Going on, but that's interesting. So the rival hypothesis that you have, or intuition, is there's really some lever, uh, some basis of leverage, uh, some resource that something Johnson has that's making Russell basically say yes. He even said, like, you know, fine, I can't, you know, put the FBI at you, but it seems like it's sort of a threat. No? Well, I wouldn't say you can sort of threat. Really, yeah. now, Dick, I can't, I can't sick the FBI on you, and I can't arrest you. I'm not thinking if I'm Dick Russell, Mr. President, we're not going to do these things. Why are we talking about them? <laughs> well, I think it is a veiled threat because who, of course, is head of the FBI? J. Edgar Hoover. And J. Edgar Hoover has a file on everybody. Russell's economic transactions. And I don't think that's a pretty thought to contemplate. And Johnson, of course, is quite tight with Hoover. So it's, it's a, it is a threat. Yes? I'm just curious. I mean, this. Were, are, are you saying this was his exercising a, a personal power technique in his positional frame sort of thing? Right. I mean, it's because yeah. it was a positional move, and clearly, like obviously, he can't make the threat unless he's in the position to do so. So, so how, he's using how his positional power as president? You're saying right? right yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So, but then, so how is this not just a positional power move in it? In, and how are you characterizing it as something? Oh, that's a nice question. That? Well, here's where I would answer that question. Contrast Lyndon Johnson's behavior with John Kennedy's behavior. We have a lot of audio tapes. Johnson would get on, or Kennedy would get on the phone to a senator or a congressman or somebody he needs a vote on and say, you know, I really could use your vote on the civil rights legislation. And the person might say, you know, Mr. President, I'd love to help you out, but I've got constituents who won't go for it. It would kill me politically. And Kennedy often would say fairly politely, well, I fully understand your position. Thanks for considering it. And hang up. Johnson basically wanted to get that vote. And so the... Both people have positional power. The difference is Johnson is also willing to augment that personal power by the exercise of this kind of arm twisting. Now, basically, by the way, what's interesting is there are people who say no to Lyndon Johnson. There are people on these phone conversations who just refuse to do it. They invoke some principled argument or say, I just can't do it, Mr. President. But what's interesting about Lyndon Johnson is he almost immediately picks up the phone and he goes the next person on his list because he's always got a backup. And then we have audio tapes of Johnson calling back some of the people who refused him in the past, and he'll say, you let your country down last time I called you, I hope you're not going to do it again. He's shameless. <laughs> you know, basically, he eventually wants to get to yes with everybody. But he's pragmatic and resourceful. So in a way, he's getting things done. We may not like his style, and it may not be for us, and it may burn a lot of bridges, but in lots of ways, this is a man who got an awful lot done in a, in a world where it's hard to get things done. And Russell did serve on his commission. Uh, any other thoughts or observations? I mean, I think we hit most of the key things, but, uh, and I hope it's clear I'm not recommending this. But what's interesting yeah. is, is when you see, I mean, Johnson rose to the leadership fairly quickly in, in the Senate, and even when he began, you know, the, the famous stories of when he was at White House, I mean, when he was a, um, a, a staffer in the House and lived in a boarding house and would shave multiple times every morning because he was spending the entire, you know, couple hours of uh, shaving and getting ready so he could meet everybody and get to know them personally. At that point, he had absolutely no positional power, none whatsoever. And yet, within a couple of weeks, he was um, uh, 
elected to be the, the head of all of the uh, new staff in the, in the House of Representatives. So it's that interaction between personal power and, and positional power. When he had no positional power at all, he was still remarkably powerful. Got the position, used it to get the position. Yeah, and you know, this is a really lovely story if you don't mind me embellishing because it shows how you can take somebody a position that even seems to have no positional power, live in the basement of this hotel, very little power, one among many people with very little power, but Johnson immediately realizes information is power. And so one of the first things he realizes is I have to get to know people as quickly as possible. How many of us really would be too self-conscious to take, go down to a men's room and shave five times. John's would go down, shave, talk to people there. Most people when they're shaving are pretty relaxed and comfortable, banter back and forth. He'd go up to his room, wait, go back down. <laughs> that was a very efficient way to get to know people really quickly. And I suspect a lot of us would not have done that. But I think it's a lot of Johnson's ascent. It also shows the flexibility of his approach. Because all the accounts of him in those days early on is that he was charming, ingratiating, talking to secretaries, talking to just sucking people for information. And he did right. Think of yourself here in the program. How many of you are, you know, I don't know, I don't think I can make it too silly, but I mean, how fast do you learn in the system? You know? When Henry Kissinger was here as a graduate student, he created a seminar series, and as part of that seminar series, it allowed him to invite, invite world famous leaders here to Harvard. Now, thank you. For, you want to get on the phone with David Gergen, and then you say, well, I'm, I'm Bob, and I want to meet you, David. Do you have some time to meet with me? Versus calling saying, you know, Professor Gergen, I'm in charge of this seminar series here at Stanford. I'd really like to invite you. And, and suddenly you're legitimate. And you get to pick up David Gergen at the airport, maybe take him to the talk, have time with him. And Henry Kissinger did this. And he also created, as many of you may know, a journal that he would invite famous people to work, contribute to his journal. The main purpose of this journal, by most accounts, was to allow Henry Kissinger to publish their papers and get to know them. And he got to know the network of people in his years here as a graduate student, the very few graduate students came to it. So, you know, there's a kind of political intelligence behind this behavior. It might be off-putting to us, but these people are very crafty and smart in a way that I think we can learn something from. Uh, any other observations or questions? Because it's a lovely discussion. Yes? Um, how much of the personal power that you see here with Linda Johnson do you think is sort of innate, and how much of it is learned? Because the histories of Linda Johnson and the story of his life, these behaviors were prevalent when he was a kid in his family and it talks about how he got through high school and how he got into university and then once he was at the school how he you know fixed the elections and how he got his way into the president's <laughs> office and all of these stories about how he I mean this was sort of prevalent in him for his entire life. How how does it develop you know, nature versus nurture? You know, it's a key question. Because first of all, if it's mostly instinct and nature, if you're born with these things, why study them and talk about them? My own view is that obviously all of us are born with different endowments. Uh, Lyndon Johnson on television didn't look very handsome. I've talked to many people and read many accounts of people who met Johnson. That in person, he was a very dynamic, fairly attractive man. He dressed very nicely. He was a very skillful dancer. He was very funny. So socially, he was much more charming and attractive as a person than you might think from some of the uh, presidential speeches and stuff we remember him by. Uh, his father was a politician, and he actually learned a lot of political skills following his father around. He loved campaigning with his father. Now, you know, Donald Trump uh, talks about learning real estate negotiations from, from the time he was, I think, three or four or five by playing in his father's office while his father was doing real estate negotiations. Not the learning principle most of us probably <coughs> seek in life. But, you know, I, I think what looks like uh, nature sometimes uh, is often the result of early experiences that are quite formative. And then getting turned on, getting excited. Johnson said, he was never happier than when he was on the campaign trail, watching his father argue. Now, most of us wouldn't find that a great way to spend our time. Yeah. Uh, so, it, it, and it's a passion. I mean, you know, Johnson once said famously, "I never think about politics more than 18 hours a day. Never read books." You know, he'd go to the baseball game. You know, you, I, I'm sure you've heard these accounts, but he'd go to the baseball game with uh, Richard Russell because Russell liked baseball, and Johnson hated baseball. But he'd go there, and while he was there, he'd be talking to people, waving to him, and networking at the baseball game. Johnson just spent his whole life doing this. So I think that was a big part of it. If it's your passion, I think you learn and you absorb it. So much so, by the way, that I think it almost does seem instinctive. We know John Kennedy, who's often credited with being such a great, eloquent speaker, and of course he was, but he was a very shy speaker in the beginning. He was a very shy person. Tip O'Neill, uh, 
uh, in one interview, he talks about how John Kennedy, when he would give a speech, when he was first campaigning, his back would be against the wall, and probably unconsciously he'd be moving towards the exit because he was too shy to wait. Uh, shake people's hands, and he'd leave after his speech. And people would say, "What? What happened?" You know, he was a very shy guy. But then he got better at it. Uh, uh, any, any other questions? The great question. Uh, any other questions? Yes. One of the fun things to to watch with students who don't think they have this ability is you put them in a situation where they they can learn and they learn the ability. You know, it's not a natural instinct for most people. I think. Mean, who would actually trust somebody who has that innate ability? And, and I wouldn't. They're kind of aging, right? But you can learn to have uh, an engaging style, at least at the margins, and largely through experiential learning. You're not going to learn it in books. You're going to learn it in simulations. You're going to learn it in negotiation simulations, or course simulation, uh, and those kinds of things. But I really think that from watching the students at point A to point B by the time they graduate, I've seen so many people transform in their ability to have uh, you know, certain leadership skills. And largely through failure, right? We learn, I think you learn a lot through failure. So what we try and do at Harvard is put you in a position to fail. <laughs> <laughs> but they graduate. Right. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, I've seen a lot of people uh, be able to change. One reason I think your nature and nurture question is so wonderful too or so interesting is, and we, and we certainly don't have all the answers to the question, but I'm amazed at how, I, I do a lot of research in Hollywood, which is an area I'm also really interested in, so I can get an interview a lot of people, and I also read a lot of interviews and things, and it's amazing to me how many people who are performers actually find performing terrifying and hard. So like Catherine Hep Hepburn used to talk about physically losing her meals before performing. Uh, Richard Burton would talk about having to get drunk before he performed Shakespeare because he would have stage fright so badly. Now, we don't think of these people as having stage fright, but they do. But they love what they do so much that they still go out on stage. Richard Burton, once in an interview with David Frost, said, you know, the hard thing for me was learning to drink just the right amount so I could do Shakespeare brilliantly and not drinking too much where I'd be too drunk to perform. And he said, very poignantly, he said, you know, sometimes I got it wrong. <laughs> think about that. How many of us would live with that Faustian bargain? You know, okay. So, uh, yeah. Well, I, right, I can know. I just give a, yeah, I'm sorry please. to interrupt. Sure. Again, but I actually, I, um, one of the great politicians I've ever experienced is David Pryor, who was a senator from Arkansas for years and was, was Bill Clinton's mentor in the personal style and how to get the job done. And I was on the search committee when we hired him to be the director of the Institute of Politics. And after he said yes, uh, freshly in Cambridge, and uh, the most charming man you could possibly imagine. And he, uh, he said, we decided we were going to go to lunch and you know, fill him in on you know, the internal politics of the Kennedy School. By the way, the dean at the Kennedy School could play the part of, uh, of a bully. That kind of is totally <laughs> mad. Uh, those kinds of telephone calls do happen. Um, so, uh, we met at the forum, and Fryer said, uh, well, we're going to go to lunch. What kind of lunch do you want? I said, well, let's try pizza. Oh, is there a pizza place? I mean, he had this very interesting conversational style. He was very excited about going to Pizzeria Uno because he'd never been there, and so we're walking up the, uh, and he's talking to people as we go. Up. Now, this man is retired. He's never going to run for public office again. So we get into Pizzeria Uno, and, uh, and he's just charming. You just want to be around him. I want to get to, to the seat. Right, so um, there's a, our table is in the back. I follow the hostess, and 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 David Pryor goes up to everybody and says, oh, well, that looks good. <laughs> I've never been here before. I this is a good place." By the time he got to our table, he had visited every table in the restaurant, every single one, and it wasn't in one of those icky ways. It was not. This is the most charming, wonderful man I have ever met. And by the time he sat down, I'm thinking, oh, I got to tell him all about the politics. I had nothing to tell him. <laughs> he could have been elected um, unanimously by the people of each other. <laughs> and there wasn't anything icky about it. Here was just this person who was genuinely connecting with <clears throat> is that Is that a, a stuffed shell? So what do they stuff that with? Is that a vegetarian? Are you a vegetarian? I mean, it was a totally... <laughs> It was amazing to watch. Amazing. And genuine. Totally genuine. 
That makes people fascinated. Yeah. And I, I should say in answer to the question, you know, because I'm not endorsing behavior, what we do in the class, what I teach them with the MBA students, for example, and the Kennedy School students, is we role play how to respond to this. Because in fact, it's kind of unfair, isn't it? You know, it's, Richard Russell's at home, and the president's already made this announcement. Don't you love the way Johnson says, Dick, uh, can I talk to you for a minute? Uh, I just want to let you know, as if I'm doing you a favor, I made that, announce I made that announcement. Well, you have already, and he knows what the announcement is, because uh, Johnson's already talked to him about it. And, you know, basically, Johnson has now put Richard Russell's back against the wall. Because in order to undo this, think about this, it's been publicly announced to the press. Johnson is very skillful working in the press in terms of uh, making everyone think this was an important decision and stuff. Richard Russell now has to imagine what? If he wants to really say no to this commission, what does he have to do? He's got to go to the press and explain why he does not want to serve on a panel <laughs> to investigate the death of the President of the United States. That's not a pretty picture for any politician, a Democrat, a revered Democrat, uh, to contemplate. And he, Johnson knows that. You know, it's a great example of what Schelling, who just got the Nobel Prize, called a compelling strategy. It removes degrees of freedom from that little decision tree. And what we do in the class is try to teach students how to open up those trees, uh, branches of the decision tree in their favor again. You can remind the president, first of all, that, yeah, I'm sorry you did that, Mr. President. Would he give me some time to think about it? But I just can't do it, and here's why. Uh, and and Russell, Russell could have gone off if he wanted to. Uh, anything else? I don't want to beat Russell to death. Uh, this is one more. Do we have time for one more example? Oh, Are we okay time-wise? Okay. Yeah, we're, we're staying till 11 tonight. Oh, good. <laughs> it's okay. Good. <laughs> well, I'll show you. I, uh, the complete nightline version. <laughs> uh, let me show you the next one, uh, and let me set up just a second. This is another lovely close encounter between Lyndon Johnson and Sergeant Shriver. Uh, now, Sergeant Shriver at the time, in the 1960s, was head of the Peace Corps, some of you remember. Uh, Brother-in-law of the President. Uh, Sergeant Shriver had a great deal of affection for John Kennedy. When Kennedy was killed, he was thinking of leaving the uh, Peace Corps. He wanted to spend more time with his family, uh, uh, maybe go back into private life. Uh, did not have much affection for Lyndon Johnson, as many people did. And so uh, Sergeant Schreiber is, is thinking of even leaving uh, Washington altogether, or leaving the Peace Corps. But Johnson's got bigger plans for him. Not only does he want him to continue to head the Peace Corps, he wants him to take on the job of leading the war against poverty. This is another hot potato. You know, what an intractable problem in the 1960s. No easy whim, no clear programmatic direction. Uh, and Johnson is going to ask Sergeant Schreiber to take this on. And the reason I wanted to put these two tapes together is because it was a common modus operandi of Lyndon Johnson. Sergeant Schreiber is home on a Saturday morning, relaxing with his family, and he gets a phone call from the President of the United States. Now watch the velocity again of this influence attempt. Uh, Sergeant Shriver is a very crafty guy. He tries to say no to this request in lots of different ways. Quite reasonable, rational arguments why he shouldn't do this. And Johnson just refuses to accept any of those uh, objections. And then Johnson does something very cute, which I need to tell you to set the tape up. And that is that at one point Johnson will sort of suggest he's the victim, that the press has been pestering him about this because Sergeant Shriver is clearly the best person to do this. Well, what Sergeant Shriver did not know for literally decades until these audio tapes were released is that before he called Sergeant Shriver, Johnson had been calling different journalists saying, I'm going to announce Sergeant Shriver. I'm going to give you that scoop. And so the press, of course, has been eagerly writing about this, thinking they have a scoop. And so Sergeant Shriver has been set up. But he doesn't know this, of course. Uh, so this is uh, Lyndon Johnson, and uh, uh, Jeffrey, if we could, we're going to show just the Sergeant Shriver part first, all the way when we should stop here. Okay. And it's think, and shoulder to shoulder with the people of York. Johnson made it McNamara's war. I want them to get off their butts and get out in those jungles and whip hell out of some communists, he said. And I want them to leave me alone because I've got some bigger things to do right here at home. This administration today, here and now, declares unconditional war on poverty in America. The war against poverty was the war that Johnson really wanted to fight. 
In his first State of the Union address, he reached back to the populism of his father and grandfather. He took a Kennedy anti-poverty proposal and made it his own. It will not be a short or easy struggle, but we shall not rest until that war is won. The richest nation on earth can afford the winning. We cannot afford to lose it. When Lyndon Johnson became president, 35 million Americans were living below the poverty line in the most affluent country in the world. I said, but they don't vote. They don't have any organized lobbies. How in the world are you going to get uh, any substantial legislation on poverty? In fact, Kennedy couldn't. How are you going to do it? He leaned back and he said, and these words are engraved on my memory. He said, I don't know whether I'll pass a single law or get a single dollar appropriated, but before I'm through, no community in America is going to be able to ignore the poverty in its midst. Johnson now turned to the director of the Peace Corps, Sergeant Schreiber. One Saturday morning, he called me up and said that his radio show, which he had every Saturday, was going to go on a couple of hours, and he wanted to announce that on that show that I was going to be the new head of the War Against Poverty, or the head of the new War Against Poverty. I said, well, Mr. President, really, you know, I haven't had a chance to speak to my wife. I haven't had a chance to talk to any people in my office. I don't know what they'll think about it in the Peace Corps. Couldn't you just postpone that, frankly? I would rather talk to you about it next week. He said, well, now, Sergeant, he said, no, the truth is we've got to get on with that War Against Poverty. So please talk to Eunice now. Just talk to her now, and uh, I'll call you back. I put the phone down. I couldn't believe it. Next thing you know, the phone rang again. There was the president. On. So, well, what did you decide? And I decided, I said, well, Mr. President, it would really be much better for me and my family if we could just talk about this next Monday or Tuesday and, and see what, uh, I have a better idea of what you want me to do. And I'm afraid if you announce that I'm the head of the war of poverty, people ask me what I'm going to do about it, and I don't know. And that would be a source of embarrassment to me and maybe not so good for you. He said, well, Sarge, you said, you know, I have this radio program. It's going on about an hour. He said, let me call you back. So he called me back about uh, 20 minutes later, and in a very low voice, confidential sound voice, he said, now listen, he said, I'm going to announce you, and I can't speak about it loud because I have the whole cabinet here in front of me. But you just have to understand, Sergeant, this is your president speaking, and I'm going to announce you as the head of the world as poverty. Looks as if I'm going to be the new head of the world against poverty. President <laughs> Johnson's program on poverty is distinguished in at least four ways. In six short weeks, Johnson had come up with his package, but he would let Schreiber worry about the details. So I was just going to say, ladies and gentlemen, that's the way Sergeant Schreiber remembers that telephone conversation. And as you'll see, his memory is pretty good, but it turns out we do have the audio tape of this conversation. And just listen to the lovely, earthy language, the velocity, the manipulation. Sergeant Schreiber has no chance, really, to say no. And then notice at the very end how Johnson Hughes manages to get a little dig in uh, Sergeant Schreiber's Catholicism. Uh, knowing he's a devout Catholic. When we come back, we'll hear some classic Linda Johnson Stronger. There was a war that Lyndon Johnson was determined to launch. Had it not been for Vietnam, he might have gone down most prominently in history, this one-time senator from Texas, as the president who did the most for the poor and the victims of racial injustice. He had decided, for example, to wage a war on poverty, and he knew just whom he wanted as his field commander. Sergeant Shriver, director of the Peace Corps, brother-in-law to the late President Kennedy. As you'll hear, Shriver was not initially enthusiastic. When Johnson had made up his mind, he was a force of nature, not to be denied.
Right guy for the right time then. Interesting observation, yeah. <laughs> you know, context and timing is a big part of the success or failure. Is, is it Joe? Is it, yeah. yeah, Joe. You know, I, 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 the one area where I certainly think he'd be fabulous, would have been fabulous is the inter intervention with Hurricane Katrina, for example. This is a guy who would have gotten on the phone and gotten things moving down there because he had great compassion about these things too. Uh, he would he would have known how to twist arms. So I think in certain situations he was great. Uh, obviously, in other situations like managing the Vietnam War, I think not so great. You know, uh, will you think of a particular context or example of where he wouldn't have? I mean, how, what, what's your prediction about how he would have played out today? I, I think he would have been. I think he would have been fine. I just think that that sort of style. Um, it's harder to be the the alpha male today than it was probably 30, 40 years ago. So uh, to be the fire the pound gorilla and throw your weight around, yeah. I think it's a, it's a little different. I think people might react a little, a little more negatively. And the media uh, scrutiny, the secrecy, the duplicity, all that would have been much less easy to pull off, I think, today. Yeah, yeah. yeah Dean, uh, uh, Graham Allison has a lovely quote. He says, it's hard to be, it's hard to share a bath with an 800 pound elephant, even when the elephant is trying to be nice. And I think with Lyndon Johnson, it's kind of a lovely quote, because this man is just probably too big for our time today. His style would not have worked so well in the television age. Yes? You mentioned before that Kennedy had a different uh, did, did Kennedy ever employ Johnson as his bulldog? Um, no, that's interesting because there's an interesting strategy called the lightning rod strategy where you have a pit bull do a lot of your dirty work. And of course, I think George Bush has been very effective at that. And it allows the leader to keep his or her Teflon. Uh, it's a very effective strategy. Lyndon Johnson, uh, 
uh, was a very passive aggressive vice president. Uh, he often did not come to Kennedy's aid. Uh, I think he resented being vice president. This is my own interpretation of a lot of his behavior. It's a, it's a conclusion Kennedy came to, I think, himself in, in some of the oral histories. Uh, Johnson just was kind of uh, petulant, a little bit depressed being vice president, and was not willing to burn up a lot of political capital. Uh, and although I'm not an expert on congressional politics, my understanding also is that when Johnson left Congress, he lost a lot of his power. You know, he was not as effective. Uh, he was now in the White House. Uh, it's a little bit like what happened to Michael Ovitz when he gave up his agency. Suddenly, he had no power, and he had a lot of enemies. And Johnson had left a lot of enemies in Congress. So, uh, the long answer to your question is I don't think he turned out to be quite as valuable as Kennedy had hoped he would be. Is that what you think? Yeah, he, he clearly, they, they clearly kept distance. And President Kennedy did not use Lyndon Johnson. He didn't trust Lyndon Johnson. President Kennedy was, if, if you had done a survey of other members of the Senate, was the least respected member of the Senate when he ran for president. Uh, um, not unlike John Edwards running for president in 2004. Extremely low on everyone, in everyone else's estimation. So uh, President Kennedy had felt, you know, that disapproval while he was in the Senate, and his own majority leader had snubbed him time and time again. Uh, of course, President Kennedy would not have won had President had, had uh, Johnson not been on the ticket. So they they had a very awkward and important marriage. But as soon as he was in the White House, um, President Kennedy again had a great distance. Was now in a different position. So they didn't utilize each other. And the Kennedy brilliance, I think, was aligning himself with Johnson on the campaign. That was a brilliant coalition there, yeah. uh, an essential one, I think. I think a lot of historians feel, but it did not help his presidency. Yes, right. I was thinking about it just from the standpoint of leadership. You recognize that um, a particular scale is not in your um, in the cards, but uh, you yes. have a partner who's yeah. got yeah. a strength in that, so you ask them to play. Absolutely. And, then, and related, um, what uh, Johnson wanted in these two cases was uh, he wanted something to come out of the Warren Commission, and in this case he wanted um, some effective uh, really advanced symbols from the Warren Party. So he must have selected people that he thought were going to be effective leaders in doing this. Yes. So in the same way that he was effective in getting people on board. Yeah. Was that the case? Did these people have um, leadership skills and styles that were um, effective in getting them? I mean, I'd say that's a really terrific question because Johnson was a very perceptive person about sizing up people's strengths and weaknesses. He really was. He was a very shrewd uh, judge of character. And in the case of the Warren Commission, he really wanted people he could trust, their political judgment. Uh, and so loyalty and the willingness to go along with the FBI report, for example, uh, was very important to him. Uh, he didn't want an independent investigation of the assassination. So loyalty was important, and he felt Russell could be counted on for loyalty. In the case of Schreiber, Schreiber was a tireless worker. He had a reputation for having done a terrific job, my understanding is, with the Peace Corps. He was one of these people who worked 18 hours a day, was passionate about his work. And Johnson did think he'd be great in his position. Now, Barbara Kellerman is more of an expert in the area of more oncology than I am. But my understanding is Johnson, because he was so manic about launching these programs, although he did pick Sergeant Schreiber to head the war poverty, he did do everything he could to make sure it worked. John Gardner has talked about this as well. He was so distracted, he didn't always give Sergeant Schreiber the support and resources he needed, especially as Vietnam claimed more of his attention. Uh, but Schreiber was a good choice. He was a shrewd choice. And he did a good job initially. So that, you know, that's the other side of Johnson. There were people who did these things for Johnson who were initially resistant. But they said ex post, looking back on it, it's one of the greatest things I ever did. So Johnson had the ability to pull things out of people. He's a complex man. He's a complex man. No, no, please. Sure. It's not very many black people would, um, would do things for Johnson. That seems like an ask. If someone called me and said, I just announced the press that you're going to do this, I would do it. Um, you know, that does put me in an awkward position, but in the future, I probably would steer clear. You know, I think, uh, I think it's a short. Uh, Short-sighted strategies. The young woman who left, but we mentioned. Uh, yes, you want to respond to that? I was, yeah, I was actually going to completely disagree with Nathan. Um, I thought I found it very refreshing, and I think that if the president of the United States called, like because he does have this understanding of people's strengths and weaknesses, 
if he called me up and even if he was swearing a little bit and being heavy handed, I mean, I, I, I found that, found that refreshing and I mean, granted, like maybe if I was, no, I think even if I were the person on the other end of that phone, it would like engender like my belief in his knowledge to like have confidence in me. And he is picking you, you know, he says to Sergeant Schreiber, if you can't run a $500 million program and a billion, on the other hand, you're not as smart as I think you are, but the, really the implicit message is you are yeah. as smart as I think you are. And notice he says to Russell, you're my man on that commission. Because Russell says, you know, I don't have confidence in Warren. I don't like that man. And Johnson says, well, that's why I need you on that commission, because people do have confidence in you, Dick. You're my man. You know, Johnson uses, you know, Technically, I consider this a great illustration of what's called the emotional contrast strategy. All of us have heard of the good cop, bad cop strategy. A colleague of mine, Robert Sutton, has done a really lovely study of the efficacy of this strategy uh, to get compliance or get people to say yes. And the good cop, bad cop strategy normally works, of course, by having a good cop and a bad cop. Well, I think Lyndon Johnson felt that's very inefficient to have two people do this. Mm -hmm. I'm going to do both roles and just mix them up. And he did. He was a one-man good cop, bad cop. So there's there's threat and intimidation, but it's mixed with a lot of appreciation and flattery. And I should say, in, honest, in fairness to Johnson, I should say, by the way, that Johnson was tireless on the telephone, and, and Ted Koppel mentions this was the fourth call of the day. If you actually look at the, they've edited these down to their most juicy parts. If you actually listen to the entire conversations, they, there's a lot of ingratiation there. Sarge, you know, you're, I'm going to support you. You're the man for this job. The, the people need you. He's, he's flattering, so there's more to it. It's more complex. So there is this kind of, you know, saying, I'm so glad you're willing to do this, because you're the right person. Yes? Um, I was just going to say, for those of us that were at the leadership training, the training was this past weekend, and we spoke about the difference between getting someone's cooperation and getting their commitment. Yes. And when I listen to this, I hear cooperation, but I don't think I hear commitment. Is that it? Yes, a different set of skills. Right, exactly. Is that a different set of skills? I mean, he's throwing his power around and he's getting them to do what he wants them to do, but I don't see him inspiring them or getting them kind of very committed. Is that not power? Is that some other set of personal skills? Well, it's different. I mean, it's a different way of thinking about power and getting compliance with what he gets in these situations without decommitment necessarily. On the other hand, Johnson was skillful at supporting people, and so he would help them, and maybe over time that would come. I just want to underscore this last point because um, he he was. I mean, someone recently described described Tom Delay as the concierge right, of, of the House of Representatives. Tom Delay now suddenly disgraced an extremely powerful leader of the Republicans in the House. Um, uh, Johnson was also like a concierge. He knew when your birthday was, when your spouse's birthday was, the birthdays of all of your children, the schools that they went to, whether or not there had been a birthday party, uh, what kinds of gifts were given, if you were having marital difficulties, you should know about it, and, and, and would it be there to support you, would do favors for you. I mean, the favor, there, there's this process of ingratiation that can lead towards true commitment. And we're only seeing the end when he's making the critical pitch. But these are relationships that have gone both ways. The president's done favors for people for many, many years. All of us possibly. Lots of reciprocity. And passion, too. Lyndon Johnson really believed in these things. And I think he picked people who believed in these were important things. You know, Sergeant Schreiber was a devout Catholic. He cared a lot about these programs, social programs. So Johnson says, call it the Pope. Tell him you won't be in church, but you're going to work for the humanity. This is a, it's a clever guy. Now, the other thing, I let me make one other pitch for why this is interesting to think about for all of us in this room, ladies and gentlemen. And what got me into in, this interest in intimidating me is aside from the fact that we sometimes produce important results in, in, in difficult situations. But when I talk to a lot of executives, uh, both at the Kennedy School and the Senior Executives Fellows Program, and at, at the Kennedy's, or at the Business School at Stanford, we have a Senior Executives Program, I ask leaders to indicate what they feel they're lacking. So this is kind of a reflective exercise, similar to maybe the know thyself sort of stuff you've been doing. And I thought the executives would say things like, well, I want to be more charismatic, I want to have higher emotional intelligence, I want to be a better team builder. I kind of expected these kinds of answers on their surveys. 
Instead, what many of them said is, I have enough social intelligence, I have enough emotional intelligence, what I really lack is toughness, tenacity. Where I really feel I've lost is the bargains against people like you know, Murdoch or uh, Harvey Weinstein, whoever it is. Yeah, I'm not tough enough. I don't know how to press. And so I thought, you know, it'd be interesting to begin to think about why some of these, and this is an extreme example, but maybe a lot of us are not sufficiently good at using intimidation and coercion when we need to, that we're not tough enough. So, you know, in this continuum of behavior, cooperation, conciliation, soft power, hard power, intimidation, maybe a lot of us are too far on the left, and therefore we need to gain to the trade, as they say in the negotiation literature, on the table, because we don't press hard enough. I mean, how many of us would press this hard? John Kennedy did. Yes. I, I'm kind of curious how Johnson would, or someone acting in the way that he's acting, would react to someone who comes back at him just as hard. Oh, yeah. Let me get this straight, Mr. <laughs> President. If you announced me to run this program and you hadn't even asked me? No. Well, now that's exactly what I did. And <laughs> yeah. I don't think I really appreciate that. And I don't know why you did that. In fact, I find that almost insulting. Yeah. For you, you know, I wonder what, if it would be a dog fight or whether they'd say, all right, now, you're not appointed. It'd be a dog fight. <laughs> it's a lovely question because there were people who stand up to Lyndon Johnson, Everett Dirksen was one, and they'd have these lovely dog fights. That's exactly. Uh, and then Johnson would laugh and he'd say, well, you got me this time, but I'm going to call you again. <laughs> and Jack Valenti said Johnson had a, a, a aphorism that he'd say. Uh, Jack Valenti, when he called these people, he'd say, the president wanted to remind you that if you say yes, he'll always remember. If you say no, he'll never forget. <laughs> you know, so he's going to get you eventually. But, but Johnson respected people who could stand up to him. I would think so. It sounds like the person who says yes is going to get called the next time he needs <laughs> yeah. somebody. Yeah. No, John, and Johnson had a lovely sense of humor. And by the way, one way to treat Johnson uh, uh, was with a sense of humor to show that you could take it. That one of my favorite responses to Senate, Johnson called a, a senator, I believe, at 2 or 3 in the morning and said, you know, did I wake you? Because Johnson <laughs> always you know, And the senator said, no, Mr. President, I was just laying here hoping you'd call. <laughs> no, 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 no. And Johnson just left. You know, Johnson had a sense of humor. And so if you knew how to work him, you could work him. Uh, but, you know, the, the important point behind your question in some ways, in, in order to work him, you had to be just as quick and just as fast out and know how to read Lyndon Johnson. And most of us in real time, so I believe, don't think quickly enough. We're kind of like Sergeant Shriver relaxing on a Saturday, and so we're fumbling. And so one reason to study this in the role play is to get more facile in real time, responding more effectively when it happens to you. Because usually what my experience has been, because I'm a little slow, is it's usually late at night, I'm laying in bed, and I think, oh, that's what I should have said. <laughs> and it's too late. The moment is gone. The meeting's over. All I can do is wake up my wife, who doesn't care about this at all. You know, tell her this is what I should have said, and she'll say, go back to sleep. You know, it's too late. So in real time, you've got to do it. And that was Lyndon Johnson's genius. And you know, to get back to your nature nurture question, in Robert Carroll's last book, Master of the Senate, what I found really impressive is he described Lyndon Johnson as a young man trying to do all this stuff, but actually failing a lot, making enemies, pissing people off, excuse my language, and the door is being slammed on his face. But Johnson doesn't give up. He keeps trying. It sounds like you from your shaking your head, you read the book. Yeah, right? the series yeah. is incredible. Isn't it? The series is great, and that's just a great book. Well, and there's so like, he's learning. Mm -hmm. yeah. he, he has this just intense anger. There's this really great story about when that happens, and he has a book. I think it's Russell, actually. And for whatever reason, he makes all those people angry. And then the Congress starts slamming the doors on him, and he's not getting invited to these meetings yet. He still has this really great relationship with the White House. And there's one particular meeting where he goes up to the door, gets slammed in his face, he can't come in. And he just yells in the halls of the Senate, you know, I can get into the White House any day of the week, but I can't get into this lunch, or I can't get into this meeting, or whatever it was. And just this intense anger that he would feel when things like this would happen to him caused him to never give up. Yeah, and actually, you know, I'm so glad you mentioned anger, because one of the things I've been really intrigued about uh, is the strategic use of anger as a kind of emotional intelligence of these intimidating people. Now, that's not the way we think about emotional intelligence, but I've been uh, doing this research, as I mentioned in Hollywood, looking at the behavior of people like Scott Rudin, uh, Harvey Weinstein, Michael Eisner, and these people are angry. And they use their anger as a weapon to motivate themselves, to keep themselves going. They do not want to lose anything. Somebody said about Harvey, he, 
when he's winning, he uses anger to stay on top. When he's losing, he uses anger to get back on top. Anger is his principal ally. And it's really an interesting way of managing ourselves. Not a great way to go through life, by the way. But it might keep you in there longer than the average person who wants to have a good life, a high quality daily experience. You know, these people do not want to give up. Their whole life is vested in whatever it is you're trying to do. I suspect a lot of you have worked with bosses like this. Their work is everything. They can't understand why their work is everything. You, they want you to have an unbalanced life just like they have. And they're going to be angry when you disappoint them. But I think, you know, the way I, I, I think about this is kind of an ecological argument. There are enough people who will say yes. There are enough people who will defer. Many people said no to Johnson, but an awful lot said yes. And basically he got the work of the nation done by those people who said yes. He didn't die a popular man, but he died a man who accomplished things. I think I should stop. I have no idea what time it is. I read there's no clock, and I realize I'm just conclude. So we should stop, I think. Six, Wait, we're pretty close. Six minutes. Yeah. Is this a good time? Yeah. If, um, I mean, I'm not going to have a few more questions for a few more minutes, but we should probably wrap up around seven. Yeah. Can I just one question? So um, as an expert on leadership and talking to us, what, what advice would you give us, or what do you think it's important that we do? try to be good leaders or in our lives? Don't, don't record anything, that's for sure. <laughs> uh, well, what type of leader do you want to be? When you ask that question, if you don't mind me throwing it back, just in the sense that uh, what sort of leader, or in what domain do you think you'll be working, what sort of issues or challenges? Well, I think a lot of us are working on a number of different issues, but social justice and fixing the world kind of thing. <laughs> yeah. So you're going to be out there trying to mobilize people and get them. So I mean, these strategies clearly are not going to be the types of things you necessarily would want to do. Um, you know, in the course I teach on leadership, that has a very different spin than the power course. What I talk about is really knowing yourself, learning where your strengths are and your weaknesses, uh, being willing to display passion if you have it. And, and the question I think this gentleman here, I think you had asked the question about uh, if you're lacking certain. What extent is it useful to bring in people who complement you? I think this complementary idea of leadership is really an interesting model because all of us have some strengths and we have weaknesses. And I think a lot of leaders think they have to do everything, so they're supposed to be charismatic. Well, a lot of leaders, as Jerry Forrest found when he did his study of built to last companies, you know, companies that did very well over the long haul, found that a lot of them lacked charismatic leaders, but they were leaders who had values and convictions. What a lot of these leaders do often is recruit people around them who fill them out, who complement them for the things they don't have. So if you're not a tough bargainer, you, you find a tough bargainer to do some of your work. I and mean, I think George Bush, by the way, has been a master team builder. He's got Condi Rice, he's got Carl Rove. This is a guy who has found a way to build a team that does a lot of the work that he doesn't himself necessarily want to do. And that's a very smart way to lead. It's, it's a collective leadership. So I, I, I always encourage people to be very analytical about their strengths and weaknesses, and then try to find out not only what you should do, but who do you want to surround yourself with that will make you a more complete, better leader. Um, and I think the Kennedy School, by the way, will emphasize a lot of those kinds of analytic skills and team building skills. But uh, the, more, the older I get, the more I think that leaders should partner with other people who are really good. I think John Kennedy, by the way, had that instinct. He surrounded himself by people he felt really intelligent and brilliant at executing. Like Robert McNamara, uh, Douglas Dillon. Mike, you know. well, can I just, before we end, um, does everyone in here know Nancy Katz? They should. <laughs> Nancy's fabulous. And you should, you should find out. Are you teaching soon? In the spring. In the spring. Can you tell everybody what you're teaching? Uh, she teaches you how to do it. Bring you with me is like my advance. <laughs> um, I teach two courses in spring at KSG. One is called Managing People, Self Relationships and Teams, which I think is what exactly what Mark Green was saying you need to uh, be good at. It's one of the things you need to be good at. And the other thing I teach is social psychology. And Nancy said in a very you know, self effacing way, but she was an incredible teacher about teams and all these group processes. You know, that's a different side of the social-emotional intelligence equation, too. But I actually do believe, by the way, this is a neglected side. I think we're not taught to be passionate and fight uh, for things, especially in areas, you know, a lot of you are going to be working in arenas where there's a lot of competition for ideas, a lot of competition for resources. And I think some of the people who move ahead more fast, more rapidly, 
uh, faster are the people who are willing to press, to fight, to knock on doors, uh, and force their way in. And I, I'm a pretty shy person myself. I'm, I'm not a Lyndon Johnson, so I think, you know, uh, there, there's a time where it might be more useful to have some of those skills. Any, anything else? I, I suspect I don't want to be from your evening festivities, drinks, uh, study, <laughs> case studies, whatever it is, but, uh, or, or a combination of both, I hope. <laughs> Any other questions or observations? Yes, one more. Uh, real, real quick, I, I just had a situation last week where I got completely rolled. <laughs> and uh, I'm still angry about it. I was thinking, I've thought of a lot of good responses in bed like over the past week. Right. And so you said that there's some, if you, you can role play and you can get better at that sort of stuff, is there, I mean, is there anything that you would recommend for like the places where I could get some resources to do that sort of stuff? Yeah, you know, in fact, you know, let me give you my email and let me think uh, about some specific answers. Um, but let me say, by the way, the question was raised about Lyndon Johnson and nature versus nurture. Not only did he have a lot of experience trying different things over years and years, striking out sometimes succeeding, but we also know that he role played in his, many of his close encounters, even with these people. He talked to his aides. What do you think about this? Would this work? Uh, and he tried out. And so he was prepared, but then he would make sure the other person wasn't prepared. He wouldn't invite them to the Oval Office to give them time to think about what's going on. He'd call them at Saturday at home when they had no time to think. But Johnson himself would actually role play with his aides. I've talked to Jack Valenti many times. He said, the man was just tireless at thinking all the angles. What's he going to say, Jack, if I and call him and offer him this thing? I don't know if many of you know, but Lyndon Johnson uh, wanted to make Jackie Kennedy ambassador to Mexico because he thought she was such an incredible asset and he wanted to keep her close. He thought it would be very embarrassing if all the Kennedy people left the administration. And so he actually called Pierre Salinger and said, you know, what do you think if I, uh, and here's a grieving widow of the President of the United States, what do you think if I uh, call Jackie and make her ambassador to Mexico? Don't you think she'd be kind of thrilled? She speaks Spanish, she'd get to dress up nice and travel. And then, you know, Pierre Salinger, bless his heart, says, well, Gee, Mr. President, you know, her husband's just been killed. I think she might need a little time to, she's got kids. You know, and Johnson just irritated. But, but he role-played it, you know, and, uh, and then learned from experience. You know, role-play role after the fact what you could have done differently. Uh, the other strategy in negotiation we teach people is try to find someone who can role-play your adversary who kind of has a similar psychology or knows them. And I guess they use this in the presidential debates. They try to find people who are likely to say the kinds of things the candidates are going to say or ask the questions the reporters are going to ask. Um, there's a whole bunch of things you can do. Uh, I also think, by the way, it's really helpful to videotape yourself. If you never videotape yourself, it's painful sometimes, but it's really useful to see You'll yourself. You'll never do it again. You'll never do it again. <laughs> and I think David Gertman teaches a course where they, people make speeches. Yes, yeah, yeah, Marie Gansberg is, uh, is largely doing You're that. You're doing it now? Yeah, that's really useful. What's amazing is you never realize how much you chew on a pencil. That's what I mean. <laughs> that's my mouth full time. Yeah. Yeah. I was amazed at how much I moved around. It's just you learn yeah. things about yourself, right? right. Uh, now, the, the other thing as a strategy, by the way, that I think is very clever and disarming is the strategy of hanging the lantern on your problem. That's a technique where you basically acknowledge you have a weakness or limitation but then, therefore, it takes the thunder out of the other person's sails. And of course, Ronald Reagan was great about this. When people questioned his intelligence, he was so undefensive about it. He'd say, oh, yeah, I, I wish I would. He got C's in college. He said, I wish I would have studied harder. You know, I, it was such a great opportunity. But of course, I was head of the debate team. I was a radio announcer, a student by president. I was on a football team. I was on a swim team. I did so many things in college, but I wish I would have stayed hard. And you see the reporters just write this down and have to debate you, you know? <laughs> so he, by being not defensive, it really took the wind out of themselves. And a great example of this, I don't have the videotape of this, but I have the uh, audio transcript of this, was Margaret Thatcher apparently really took a lot of heat for being not very feminine, being kind of tough. Uh, they called her a lot of things, unattractive adjectives in the British press and the tabloids. The Soviets, I think, famously called her the Dragon Lady. I think that was what they called her. Now, as the Prime Minister of Britain, as their leader, Margaret Thatcher could have done lots of things. She could have answered them seriously, why she is the way she is. 
she could have ignored the issue, although it was not going to go away. But instead, she did something I think very clever. She she hung the lantern on the problem of her toughness and nastiness and meanness and so forth with a little bit of humor. So she came out in a press conference dressed in an elaborate chiffon gown with her hair up uh, in a tiara. Is that how you say tiara? And, and evening makeup. And she walks up in a very dainty, exaggerated, dainty way to the podium. And she says to the press, here I am, Margaret Thatcher, in a very feminine voice, your leader, as apparently so many of you wish to see me. And there was stunned silence apparently in the room as people realized, we never want to see you like this again. <laughs> <laughs> because they realized it was absurd. Here's their leader who's going to negotiate with Gorbachev, who's going to negotiate with Reagan. We want you to be tough. But by using humor, she deflated the whole issue and had a lot of money. The ability to laugh at yourself, and of course Kennedy was famous for doing this. When Kennedy was, John Kennedy was accused of buying votes, he said to the press, you know, I just got a telegram from my father, uh, I'm not paying for a landslide, I'm just paying for a victory, no more money, so it's a famous little quip. And, and that's a very effective strategy, to be non-defensive about even your weaknesses. That can work in situations like this. So if you feel the momentum is going with you in a negotiation, or you're, you're getting the short end of the stick, you can say, you know, well, I may not be as quick as I like to be, or maybe I'm missing something, but you buy time, and you throw it back to the other person. Uh, anything else, ladies and gentlemen? I am conscious of keeping you here a long time. Should we stop? Why don't we just stop? And uh, they can come up and talk to me. Yeah, I, I'm certainly happy to hang around, and you sort of call me on the telephone, and we can do the Lyndon Johnson there on the phone. <laughs> <laughs> call me on a Saturday. I'm most vulnerable. <laughs>